FOMO is a very powerful emotion. Everybody is susceptible to it, no matter who you are or what your profession is. It's very powerful. As I said, it took us two days to, to work through those emotions, highs and lows. We both wanted it, but we ultimately knew that it just didn't make sense for it. If, if you plan accordingly, at some point in the future, you should be able to afford what you deem to be your dream home. And it's all about positioning yourself today in order to purchase it tomorrow. Welcome to Critical Thinking Required, hosted by LBW. This podcast is intended for free thinkers, entrepreneurs, and knowledge seekers. Join us as we discuss relevant financial topics, explore with guests their financial journeys, and engage with experts in industries such as space, media and entertainment, real estate, and many more. Buckle up and enjoy the ride. Welcome to Critical Thinking Required. Here with your hosts, myself, Tim Bickmore, and my colleague, Nathaniel Leach. Dan Weiss is not here today. I think this may be the first podcast that we don't have, Dan. His loss. <laughs> His loss for sure. Today, Nathaniel and I are going to talk about something that seems to be really a hot topic lately, buying a house. Now, we've talked a lot about buying houses, and we've talked about the kind of execution of it, some of the qualitative, mostly. But today, Nathan and I want to talk about the quantitative. Uh, interestingly enough, him and I have both been in the, the home search process in our own respects. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that from an advisor's point of view. Should be fun. But before we jump into it, which I'll start asking Nathaniel some questions. If you like our podcast, there is one way that you could help us out. Like, subscribe, and share to our podcast if you like our content. All right. With that being said, Nathaniel... I think I'm just going to start off with you. Can you tell me a little bit about yours and Ying's, which most of our audience should know Ying by this by this time. Um, <laughs> current experience looking for a condo here in the local area. Sure. So Ying and I have lived here now for a little over nine years. And also as a relative point, I have been in this industry, the financial industry for nine years as well. And over those nine years, Ying and I have gotten to know Madison very well. And after moving, God, I think we've lived in one, two, three, four. We've lived in four places uh, throughout Madison since we moved here. And we learned a lot about what we want and most importantly, what we don't want. So uh, we, this year, we, we made it known to a realtor who helped us sell our last home that we were looking at one building because we, we want a condo. And uh, there's this one building that fits everything that we want in terms of location uh, and everything that we're looking for. Each model, each unit is unique because they were typically built with the developer for the person that was buying them. So the layout could be different in each unit. So you have to actually go and see the units as they come on the market. So this summer, uh, we, we saw a unit and it was beautiful. It was uh, it almost looked like a penthouse in some respects, in the sense that it was a, but it was not a penthouse to be clear. Uh, but it had the, some good characteristics of one, such as it had the, I think, 11 foot high ceiling, which is, that's, that's tall in my world. <laughs> uh, it had a, a wraparound tree line with uh, the, a south, it was southeast, southeast facing and it had a view of the tree line as well as to the east, it had a view of the Capitol. It was, as I said, a corner unit. Uh, it, it was quote, library ready. So both my wife and I, we have these fantasies about having a library in, the, in somewhere in the home. And then her fantasy is specifically that we have a little nook, you know, she, she can curl up and, and read books just as she did 
uh, as a kid or wanted to as a kid, depending on her home situation, she moved quite a lot when she was a kid, when she was growing up. So uh, we, we, we both really loved that, that aspect. Uh, one aspect that I really liked was that it had like two wings in a sense. So you, you enter and then you can go one way and then you can go the other way. It splits off. And I like that aspect because in, in one wing was our, our bedroom and the kitchen area. Then the other was like our, our what we would uh, make into our den, into our living space. And I like that because if I got up at four in the morning or four thirty in the morning, like I did this morning, then I don't have to worry about uh, waking up my wife because I, I might want to get up. I might want to read something and, and maybe make a little noise, maybe go to the bathroom. I want to flush the toilet. You know, I don't want to have to worry about waking her up. So these ticked off all of our boxes. The problem was <laughs> it was too expensive. <laughs> the sledgehammer came. <laughs> <laughs> Breaking was, dreams. Yes, it, but it was expensive to the point where it took us two full days uh, with emotion, with an emotional roller coaster. Despite the fact that, uh, as I said, I've been in this industry nine years. My wife is smarter than me. So it, we're both very smart people when it comes to our, uh, when it comes to what we should do with our money. So it took us two days, despite all of our experience in this world to come to the realization that we could not afford it. We could not afford it to the sense, to the, to the point where we had to, we, we, we couldn't afford it whatsoever. Like even no matter how much creative maneuvering we could do, and I could think of some things to do really creatively when it comes to our money, despite all of that, the opportunity cost was just too great. It just, it didn't make sense. No matter how many ways we tried to shift the picture. So I do have more, but, but I'm, I'm going to, I, we can get back to that after you tell your story. And then I'm, I'm going to come back and I'm going to talk about some tricks that we learned to cool ourselves down. Yeah. I, I think it, the, the, a good way to maybe put yours is you couldn't quite justify your way into that one. <laughs> No, but you tried your you tried your damnedest though, right? Like you, oh, we really did. You gave we your best really job. tried to stretch that sucker. You yeah. bet. Yeah, I mean, ours is is very similar. It's it's probably slightly different. So Becca and I, we've been looking for homes in the area, and we're looking for a single family home. Um, you know, a home that we could potentially grow into, right? If we wanted to start a family, things in that nature, um, and have some and have our own space. Both of us are kind of over the apartment living over sharing walls with other people just because the two of us have been doing that for some time. So we're not quite going the condo route like King and Nathaniel, which they have really good points on why they want to go the condo route. We're looking more the single family homes. And what's hard is we want to be in a certain geographical area, which always then puts constraints onto what you're looking for. So we've been in the search process. We've put in on a few different homes that have gone for wildly more money than, than both of us would actually be willing to do. Now, in, in my case, uh, I'm obviously the, the finance person and I'm the one. Becca would admit very openly that finance is not her thing, nor does she want to deal with it. And so I take on that burden. And I will admit that she is definitely the one that would uh, make the home very nice and pretty. Um, and she does a great job at that, which I don't want anything to do with it. So, hey, we work out quite well, yin and yang. But overall, what's been interesting is that sometimes she looks at me and, and thinks that I'm a little bit of the Grinch. She'll probably admit that too when it comes to money, where it's like, hey, Tim doesn't want to spend. That's not always the case, but it's just making sure that we spend it rationally. But what's funny is if she would probably say that, but I actually have to tell her that I struggle through these purchases because what I see is very similar where I see, hey, this would be a great yard to have. I can see having people over. I can see entertaining that we don't get to do. There's so much qualitative factors that get played that play into the homes that we've put purchases or offers on that I get really excited. And it's really hard to eliminate some of that emotional push because in the single family home, and I don't know for sure for you, Nathaniel, but a lot of these offers have gone without inspection. And that's something that her and I are just not willing to do. 
but people will push it where even if you talk to realtors, you talk to people and say, that's kind of something you have to do if you want a house. And so then we have to weigh the, the opportunity cost. Like Nathaniel said, do we waive an inspection, put way too much money on top of this just to get a home? Is it worth it? And it sounds like that's a really easy, of course, it's not worth it, but it's not when you start thinking about that nook that Nathaniel was talking about or that yard that I'm talking about, right? It's like, well, maybe, maybe we should just and just get into it. And then what is also driving, which is coming from the both of us, in addition to what I've heard from others, is it's that our price is going to come down. Are they not going to come down? Where are interest rates going to go? So you start factoring in all these potential variables. And then it just kind of comes down to, oh man, I'm going to have that a little bit of FOMO. I'm going to have a little bit of fear that I'm going to be missing out at the right price or not being able to get into the right neighborhood. And some of those are difficult, but unfortunately for her and I, which Becca would agree because we've always agreed on the offer price and what we feel comfortable with. We haven't been the one to win that purchase, but it's not been easy. We've gotten fatigue from it where it's like we've seen houses, we've put in offers. It is tiring, but I will say the one nice thing, and I don't, I can't speak for Becca on her behalf, but I will stick on mine. The one thing that is really nice is that as much as we don't want to necessarily be in our apartment, it's still an okay place to be. Like it's still a good place to be. It's something that we can always fall back onto and we don't have to make any changes. And I think that was one of the big learning lessons for us is that we don't need to change. We don't have to change. We're not in a position where we're absolutely forced where it's like, oh man, our, you know, our landlord is kicking us out. No, it's just more that we want to be out. So we're kind of still in control of our destination, where we want to go. And so what we've realized that in this market, patience is probably going to be the only factor we have over most other people, where we hear other realtors say that their clients will come in and say, I need to be in a house. I'm moving. I just took this job. And so they're going to start making some more irrational, probably decisions because they're forced to, and we're not forced to do anything. We can have that patience. So it's been an emotional roller coaster, again, as much as Becca probably wouldn't admit that it has been for me, it, it, it has. Um, and it definitely has been for her. She didn't realize, you know, how this was going to be because she's not a part of, I deal with this right day to day. She's only dealing with it just with her and I, so she doesn't see this. So for me, a lot of it's like, yeah, I kind of knew this was going to happen. She's like, oh, hell no, I didn't know this was going to happen. So it's been a really interesting kind of emotional roller coaster, and we both go through it. It's the highs, it's the lows, um, but that's kind of been our process so far. I do have some tips and tricks. I'm curious on what your tips and tricks are, Nathaniel, because I wonder if we have similar thoughts there. <laughs> sure, I'll, I'll give it a go. Um, I, I really like that point, by the way, about do you actually have to leave? Uh, we, we are in the same boat. I, so that I would start with that one do I really need to buy this home? What's wrong like comparing to the other one, where my, my present home, do I really have to leave? In, in my particular case, I, I echo your feelings. I, we don't need to move. It's more of a want. So we're not in that position. It, adding on to that, uh, I, I would then ask, looking at your current home, determine how much of your actual square footage you're using. So for example, we, we currently live at about 850 square feet, one bedroom, one bath. It's perfect for our needs. It's very cozy. We both like that aspect. It works well for us. The place that I mentioned, this uh, quote penthouse <laughs> and unquote, uh, was 2000 square feet. It's a huge jump. Like, it, it's kind of like, okay, so I've had trouble with weight throughout my life. And both my mother and my wife have always said when we're buying a pair of jeans for me, I like them loose. I like to feel comfortable. I don't like any of that tight fit and shit. But they make an excellent point, which is that if I buy them too big, then I'm eventually going to grow into them. That it, it it's true. It does happen. It's like lifestyle inflation, but for weight. <laughs> exactly. It's true. Both of them are true. So if we were to buy such a home like that, yes, I could 
I could easily fill that place up. I, we could buy furniture. I could find uses for this room and that room. It had um, two bedrooms and then the one den. We could have made the den into a bedroom. Or if I had my way, we could make both rooms into one an office and one a den. And then that way we wouldn't have anybody sleeping over. There'd be no excuses for that. I'd be down with that, but I'd be overruled. We could find uses for this entire space if we wanted to, but do we really need it is the question you should ask yourself. In some cases, you might. You might uh, we might have a kid coming down the pipeline or my aging mother, who's fine on her own and I hope she lives on her own for the next 30 years, has to come live with us because she suddenly becomes stricken with something debilitating and she needs to be taken care of then that, that's where it might make sense. But that isn't our current situation. So that's what I would recommend. You look at what uh, you're currently using and then what would you actually use that future home square footage for. Uh, another tip, even though we're in the, the financial industry, both uh, my wife and I are, we still, this is still very emotional for us. No, no matter, like, just like Tim said, it's still very emotional. So it's always helpful to talk to somebody who's a third party. So for example, I can go to Tim or our other partner, Dan, and Ying and I can go both go to both of them and say, hey, listen, this is what we're thinking. This is what we thought about that, 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 that. It doesn't make sense, right? That's, that's what friends and family are for. That's also what your financial advisor is for. In this case, Dan and Tim are our financial advisors. So it's helpful to have a third party objectively tell you if you're thinking about this correctly. And if you're not, because maybe you might be missing something or maybe you hit it spot on the head and it's not a good idea to do. The, the last trick or, or idea I had, or excuse me, we had, Ying and I had, was that even if the number is borderline making sense, you, you still need to go through your life goals. You still, you still need to go through your priorities. Like if uh, we have an idea of that, hey, we want to retire by this age, or we want to build up our emergency fund, we don't have an, and we don't have an emergency fund, which we do, just to be clear, uh, or we want to save for this trip to Shanghai to see my wife's family, or we want to save for this trip to Rome that we've been saving up for that we should have done on our honeymoon, but we didn't, and now it's approaching 10 years, and we should probably get going on that. Look at those life goals and compare them to this home that you're looking to buy. Maybe the home does make sense. Maybe it doesn't. So compare those, those numbers to, to what your, your goals are. But if you have to stretch, even at the outset, to be able to make that down payment or make that mortgage payment with, with the inclusion of your property taxes, homeowner's insurance, the condo fee, if you have to stretch without even breaking a sweat, then the likelihood is that the purchase price in today's market, for one, the asking price is not going to be equivalent to the purchase price, as, as Tim was testifying. It's likely going to be higher than the asking price. So even if you, you have to stretch at the outset and then you go and you put an offer in and then it goes to Timbuktu, then you're going to be out of luck. I mean, you're, you're, you're pissing in the weeds. It's, it's, it's not going to happen. So you're, you're already in a poor uh, you're already in a poor um, position to, to, to make an offer. So you're not probably not going to get it in the first place. So why even go through that emotional up and down of, oh, we put our offer in. Oh, I can't wait to hear from, hear from our realtor. I hope that we get it. And then they call and they say, sorry, guys, you didn't get it. And then it's just one big roller coaster down. Oof. Yeah, those, those are great, actually, tips. The ones that I, I would I would set, set forth to is, and it's a little bit more on the emotional side, is expectation setting going in. And I think that's kind of what you were hitting on on your last, your last comment is 
I, 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 and I, the reason why I bring that up is I noticed it between the difference between Becca and I, I had an expectation of what this process was going to look like because I've dealt with it quite a bit. And so I knew going in that there was going to be an emotional roller coaster. I knew that it was going to be difficult to potentially purchase based off of the price point that we're looking at and the geographical area. But what was really interesting and poor communication on my part is Becca didn't quite have those expectations. So it was been a lot harder for her. And it took her probably a few months to realize, oh, man, this is going to be a lot different than what I thought. Um, because you, it's, it, and I think it's one thing that you, you can hear people talk about it, but until you actually experience it, I think it's just a different, a different thing. Um, and so once she kind of experienced it, she's like, oh my gosh, this is hard. And it gets really deflating. So if you can kind of sit down, do as much research or do as much communication with realtors, other people that have gone through the process, hear the horror stories and truly try not to internalize them, but really try to grasp them as much as possible, it will help you go into your scenario saying, okay, this is going to be difficult. I may have to stretch. As Nathaniel said, am I positioned to stretch? Should I or should I not? So just expectations up front is extremely important. I think the, the next piece too, to help battle with some of this, maybe not today in the patient's is what I've noticed quite a bit with our clients. And I think in in financial planning in general is that we take snapshots of today. It's easy to be in the present. So for example, that Becca and I, Ying and Nathaniel, we may not be able to get what we want today, but what we have to think about is where are we going to be tomorrow? Are our income streams going to be the same? Or is our lifestyle going to be the same? Is it going to increase? Is it going to decrease? Right? Because what could happen is that all of a sudden you got that raise at the new job. And all of a sudden that raise puts you in a position that you can now stretch. You can now go after, get into the same, the same place or, or spot that you want to be in. And so if you do have the ability to be patient because a child's not pushing you to go there, a grandparent or a parent coming to live with you isn't pushing you to go there, and you have the ability to be patient, You also have to think about where you're going to be because your situation can change rapidly. It can change pretty quickly to a point where it now allows you to start going into it. So part of that is that planning process. Nathaniel makes a very good point. Ying and Nathaniel come to me and they say, hey, guys, what do you think? What my answer might be is, Nathaniel, Ying, this may not make sense today, but let's take a look at what's going to happen tomorrow. Here is the trajectory of LBW. Here's the trajectory of your expenses. Here's what you're looking at for adding to your expenses. So maybe we just be patient. Yeah, we may have to pay a little bit more because maybe the market goes up, but hey, maybe the market comes back down. We don't know. And what I've also noticed for my last kind of snippet is that every house that you love, and I'll use Nathaniel's penthouse, what I've really, and this is my own belief, so maybe I'm a little on the outset is that every place that you think is the place that's going to be the place that you want and you don't get it, doesn't mean that there's not going to be that next place that's going to be the place that you're going to get, right? Like it does come around, it will come. And to be honest, sometimes when you get the place that's unexpected that you didn't think it was going to be your place, you move in, you settle down and you fall in love with it. And that's what's happened with me for apartments where I'm like, oh, it's uncomfortable for a minute. It's new, it's a change of space. Then you're there for a year and you're like, I'm really sad to leave, actually. Like, there's a lot of good memories we've built in here. There's a lot of good things. So every place that you step into, by the time that you want to get out, you're going to be probably nostalgic about it, unless it's just an awful experience, which can happen. But most of the time, it's just not. And so even though you may lose that place because you can't afford it today, or it may not be there right now, there will be a place that you do find, that you do get in, that you get comfortable with, and that you start to love because that's just what, it's kind of human nature. You kind of get cozy into the situation that you're in. So I don't, I think to kind of have those mindsets help you get through some of that qualitative uh, uh, roller coaster that Nathaniel just mentioned to be able to sit there and think that A, my expectations are well set. B, I'll be able to, I, I think I'll be able to afford this in the future. And if I am able to afford it in the future, whatever I do find, I think I will be able to love that place when I do find it. And so it helps you be able to kind of mitigate or become level when it comes to the roller coaster. If you don't get it, that's okay. Put the best foot forward. That's all you can ask. If you get it, great. If you don't, move on to the next and you'll be able to find something that you love. So those are some of my points. I really like Nathaniel's points too. They're really good. 
so for my final thoughts, then I, I think that I'll just say that FOMO is a very powerful emotion. Everybody is susceptible to it, no matter who you are or what your profession is. It's very powerful. As I said, it took us two days to, to work through those emotions, highs and lows. We both wanted it, but we ultimately knew that it just didn't make sense for us. And I really like your point, Tim, about if, if you plan accordingly, at some point in the future, you should be able to afford what you deem to be your dream home. And it's all about positioning yourself today in order to purchase it tomorrow. So that's, that's a very critical point, I feel. So any I, last, last thoughts, Tim? My last thought, I'm going I'm to actually take this one for, from Becca, is that she always likes to tell me when she goes shopping that I like to shop. And if I really want that shirt or pair of pants, I walk away from it and I think about it for a day or maybe two days. And then she goes, if I'm still thinking about it, then it's not something no, that I really, really want. And to kind of put that in a larger scale, I think you should take time. Don't make a decision when you're either high or low, right? Take a minute. And I know it goes quick. Don't get me wrong. I'm in this scenario. You got to make an offer like today when you're, and when you're looking at houses in the environment that we're looking in. But if you can take a minute to take a, take a step back to allow your emotions for your body to settle in and where you're kind of in a more neutral space, that's where you can start making really good decisions. When you're making decisions in the highs or you're making decisions in the lows, that's where it can get a little bit irrational. So as Becca would say, take a step back, take a day, think about it, really evaluate it and allow your, your anxiety or your excitement to come down. And then you can go ahead and make that decision because then you know that it's probably the right decision to make. So that's my last thought. And so with that, we'll wrap up this session talking about our own personal stories when it comes to buying a home. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for listening, and we hope you all have a good night. Thank you for taking the time to start your journey of thinking differently and listening to LBW talk about stuff they love. Until next time. <laughs>